So hello and welcome to this first lecture on this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies. I'm a course instructor, Abhishek Pari, I teach English at IIT Madras. So in this first lecture today, I'll be sort of taking you through the content of the course to a certain extent, but also describing or sort of spelling out what the course is about, some of the salient characteristics of the course, some of the uh, key features of the course, and more importantly, the attitude of the course. It's very important to understand the attitude of the course. What do I expect? Uh, you to learn from this course and what should you expect from this particular course. Now, cultural studies as you know is uh, you know, it's one of the key things in academia today, especially in humanities. Uh, it is, you know, it's interdisciplinary, it brings in English studies, philosophy, psychology, political science, sociology. It can mean a whole host of things. So what I'll do in this course, uh, in this lecture today, is I'll talk briefly about the content of what is cultural studies. But before we begin that, uh, it's important to understand what is culture. Now, one of the things which you'll see in this course that we'll use certain terms, uh, which we use normally in daily discourses like culture, ideology, religion, philosophy, uh, values, etc. Sometimes we use these um, issues unquestionably. Sometimes we use these issues without really thinking about these things. So one of the things which this course aims to do is to make you conscious uh, of these, uh, you know, common, uh, you know, common terms like culture, cultural studies, identity, ideology, etc. Uh, this course is designed in a particular way. It will attempt to uh, sort of awaken you uh, to a certain extent uh, about understanding the constructed quality of these terms. So, you know, to what extent is culture constructed? To what extent is identity constructed? And once we understand culture or cultural identity as constructs, uh, the next logical step would be to question the constructs, to understand how the construction takes place. So uh, a great deal of this course, a large part of the course will be reliant, will be looking at uh, the politics of production. So by production I mean material production, by production I mean the production of abstract identities, uh, the production of abstract attributes, etc. Now before I do anything else, I think it's uh, probably most appropriate that I start with a very basic, banal definition of culture. What is culture? We need to understand something in order to deconstruct it, in order to understand it in its fullest extent. We need to know what it is in the first place. So culture. Uh, so I've just got this very common banal definition from the internet. It is from OxfordLearnerDictionaries.com, uh, where culture is defined as a noun. It's a noun. It's about a speech, uh, which is the customs and beliefs, art, way of life, and social organization of a particular country or group. Now, this is obviously the very working definition of culture. It's a set of beliefs, a set of you know way of life, a social organization, etc. Now. In order to do a serious study of culture, in order to understand culture, you know, elegantly uh, in a very sort of intuitive kind of a way, uh, we have to understand the etymology of the word culture. Where did it come from? Uh, it has traveled through different meanings, it has traveled to different discourses, and the way we use it today is not really the way it was used at one point in time. Now, a very good starting point uh, for culture is to understand culture in terms of an entanglement. Now, this is one term that is very useful, I think, in academia and, and especially in critical theory and humanities. Now, entanglement, uh, it doesn't, it, it's a mixture, of course, but it's a special kind of mixture. It's a mixture where you cannot quantify or we cannot really uh, sort of find out the content in a symmetric kind of a way. So, entanglement, by very definition, is an asymmetric mixture. It's a mixture where different attributes come together, mix together, move out together, move in together, and we can't really quantify, we can't really mark the mixture, we can't really mark the extent to which each component is mixed. Now, I read culture, and I think it's useful uh, for our purpose of this particular course, to read culture as an entanglement of material and abstract attributes. Now, what do I mean by material and abstract attributes? Now, if you look at each of the terms that I've written down, and obviously this is by no means an exhaustive list, we can add on different terms to it, but say something like language, right? The language is something which we use in daily life, we use language to communicate our feelings, we use language to communicate what we want, uh, to make ourselves understood, to make ourselves heard, to make ourselves, you know, obeyed, uh, you know, in different uh, situations. Now, what is language? And language, as you all agree, is a very key component of culture. It's one of the things which uh, characterizes a culture, uh, you know, you can go as far as saying that. Now, uh, language obviously is something of a tool. It can be seen something as uh, a, an abstract attribute. It's something which is, you know, a, a marker for a particular cultural identity. And at the same time, 
Language is also notoriously material. Now, you can have a grammar of a language, you can have a textbook of the grammar of language, you can have a dictionary of the language. And I just read out a uh, definition of culture from a dictionary uh, just in a previous slide. So language, again, uh, the, immediately it tells you it's, it's, it's an asymmetric combination of material and abstract attributes. So something that, you know, it's material, it can be, it's a palpable, tangible presence. But at the same time, there's a degree of abstraction about language. It's not something that you can hold, you know, per se. It's not something you can, uh, you know, go and purchase per se, although you can purchase a dictionary. So, you know, it's a very, you know, curious, a complex combination of material and abstract attributes. And that's something which we will find increasingly is true for almost all the cultural components. Now, I've just made a list of uh, different terms that I think will be useful. So, religion again, uh, faith, art, food habits, dress codes, forms of entertainment, all these things, very common things, very banal things, uh, forms of entertainment, um, these are very, very cultural. And again, as I said, culture, when I use the word culture, I'm looking at the word as a, as a mixture uh, of something which is material, something which is economic, something which is political, at the same time, something which is, you know, ideational, uh, or inhabits a level of ideas. And I will come to the word ideology in a, in a bit. But before I move on to ideology, let's go back and look at this, all these terms individually. Let's pick up art. Now, when we use the word art, uh, obviously, the, the, the very lofty, the elegant way of looking at art is some kind of an idea, some kind of a, a creation of human imagination, which is obviously true. But at the same time, art also exists in a very solid uh, material plane of reality. It, all forms of art, almost every production of art, and use of production quite consciously, uh, you know, is produced out of certain material conditions. So when you're saying you love, you know, the Mona Lisa, but Leonardo da Vinci, and obviously it's a great work of art, but then we have to realize also that da Vinci was creating or producing these works of art uh, in a certain historical time where he was patronized by certain families. He had great patrons, uh, you know, the, all the big uh, bourgeois Italian families were you know, patronizing him. And then, of course, that the entire economic um, condition uh, was sort of determining the kind of art he was producing. The same could be said about Shakespeare, the same could be said about Picasso, all great artists. So art cannot exist in a vacuum. So art is not just uh, some lofty creation out of an imagination of a great human mind. Now, that is obviously true, but that great human mind, that imagination also exists in a certain cultural, economic, political, material plane. So this is, again, this brings me back to this old uh, discussion, and I keep coming back to this, the idea of this combination between materiality and abstraction, right? So art is material as well as abstraction. So you, you walk, you watch a great piece of art, you see a great piece of art, you see a great painting, you, you read a great poem, you watch a great film, and all these are great works of art, uh, but then of course these are produced out of certain material conditions. So that, 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 that component of production is a very key component, I think, and that's something we should not, never lose sight of, especially not least when you're doing cultural studies. Right, so what, one of the things which cultural studies uh, should train us to do is to look at the constructed quality uh, of everything, right? When we talk about faith, uh, to what extent is faith constructed? Uh, so what are the political, ideological, economic conditions which uh, inform the construction of faith, the construction of religion? So again, religion, faith, art, uh, you know, customs, values. So these are things which you don't normally associate with material. So values, we think, is something which is inherent in us, something which we sort of, you know, uh, is in our head, is inside our brain, is not something out there. There. But what cultural studies teaches us, uh, one of the many things which cultural studies teaches us is this very complex relation between inside and outside. What is inside our brain and what is outside our brain? What is environment? Uh, to what extent are we part of the environment? To what extent is environment part of us? Uh, so by environment, again, environment is a very loaded term. We can talk about environment as a natural thing, as an organic thing, as an economic thing, as a political thing all kinds of things constitute environment. So uh, culture essentially is a way, it's a process really, it's a process through which an individual navigates their way uh, with an, an environment, you know, and the way in which an individual uh, establishes a dialogue with an environment, right? So, and again, this, this dialogue, this navigation, this embodiment, so all these are combinations of material and abstract things, and that's something I'll keep coming back to. Likewise, food habits. Right? Now, food habits obviously is a very complex thing. So food obviously is a marker of culture. You look at any culture, you find that there are different kinds of food uh, you know, pertaining or corresponding to different kinds of cultural customs or cultural situations. So there's a, 
festive food uh, for every culture, there's a food of mourning uh, for certain cultures, there's a food of, you know, you know celebration for certain cultures, there's a food of, you know, um, you know, something which is banal, something which is celebratory, something which is festive. So, you know, different social moods, different cultural moods uh, have different kinds of food. So, how do these correspondence come into being, right? These correspondences come into being through material processes, right? So, it's not an abstract thing entirely. So, food, forms of entertainment. Now, again, um, uh, forms of entertainment are very complex things because, you know, you can have what we can call high culture entertainment or you can have low culture entertainment. Now, mind you, uh, these divisions are very artificial, high culture, low culture. So, these things blend with each other all the time. So, what is high culture entertainment today might become low culture tomorrow and vice versa, right? So, um, I mean, just to give an example, we read Shakespeare today as an example of high culture. You know, we, when we read Macbeth, when we read Julius Caesar or you know, Hamlet, we think of these things as epitomes, the great works of art. And if you're watching a production of Hamlet, if you're reading Macbeth, uh, we sort of congratulate ourselves as, as consuming something which is high art. But mind you, when Shakespeare was actually writing the plays, when Shakespeare was actually producing this plays, uh, those are not meant for high culture production or high culture consumption at all. So, those were meant as mass entertainments, something very akin to mainstream film industries today, uh, whether it's Indian film industry or Hollywood or whatever. So, Shakespeare essentially wanted to be a seller of theatre. Uh, he wanted to be uh, a producer of theatre which will sell well, which will be consumed by the mass, which will be consumed by the public, etc. So, but that, that kind of theatre later on became uh, something of high art theatre. And now, when you watch Shakespeare and read Shakespeare, like I said, we sort of congratulate ourselves for consuming high culture or high art. So, again, uh, what I would want you to be aware of is the constructed mutable quality uh, of culture. And again, the, the word mutable is very useful, it's changeable. So, culture changes all the time. Uh, it's changing even as I'm talking to you, even as you listen to this video, like language. Language changes all the time. So, what is sophisticated language? What is non-sophisticated language? Again, these are very mutable categories, right? So, it's very useful for the purpose of this course, for the purpose of cultural studies, to look at culture not as a static, uh, you know, dead entity, but as an organic, alive, mutable process, right? It's a very organic process. And the organicity, the mutability of the process is something we should be aware of, uh, you know, as we study cultural studies, uh, you know, especially in as, uh, you know, as, as a complex phenomenon, right? Now, what I'll do right now is this is uh, a quotation from a book that I find very useful and I'll be drawing on this quite a lot while we're dealing with this particular course. So, this is a, a book called Keywords, a vocabulary of culture and society by a very famous uh, Marxist critic called Raymond Williams. Now, the reason why I've chosen this particular uh, quotation uh, is because it, it illustrates in a very graphic way, in a very disturbing, unsettling way to a certain extent, the mutability of culture, right? So how culture changes. Now, when I say culture changes, uh, it's a very slow process sometimes, something sometimes invisible, but of course there are certain events, there are certain um, occurrences in human history uh, which accelerates uh, these changes. Like for instance, when you have a war, uh, when you have a war of a massive scale or, and a human destruction happens, uh, you know, a human catastrophe happens, people die, uh, there's a great massive loss of you know, property, human resources, etc. Now, when something of like that happens, that can be considered to be a paradigm shift, something which generally sort of shifts the idea of culture. And, you know, if we compare pre-war societies with post-war societies, we find oftentimes we, we, we find, you know, vivid examples of change of culture. Now, this is Raymond Williams who actually fought in the Second World War. I mean, he didn't fight, but he was used uh, as some kind of a, you know, uh, an officer in the Second World War. He was basically a radio officer in the Second World War. Uh, he was used for decoding signals, etc. Now, he went to the war and then post-war he came back and joined Cambridge University. And what he's describing in this particular passage, which I'll read out to you, is the, you know, when he comes back after the war, he finds everything has changed. The way people talk has changed, the way people dress has changed, um, you know, the way people behave uh, has changed. So, in other words, there's been a cultural shift, a cultural paradigm shift, uh, you know, which uh, has happened post-war. So, this is what he says. In 1945, after the ending of the wars with Germany and Japan, I was released from the army to return to Cambridge. University term had already begun and many relationships and groups had been formed. 
It was in any case strange to travel from an artillery regiment on the Kiel Canal to Cambridge College. I had been away for only four and a half years, but in the movements of war, had lost touch with all my university friends. Then, after many uh, strange days, I met a man I had worked with in the first year of the war, when the formations of the 1930s, though under pressure, were still active. He too had just come out of the army. We talked eagerly, but not about the past. We were too much preoccupied with this new and strange world around us. Then we both said, in effect, simultaneously, the fact is, they just don't speak the same language. So what we see over here is a very interesting phenomenon and that's something which happens a lot to returning soldiers and you know returning soldiers are a very useful uh, marker uh, for change of culture because they go to the war uh, uh, in a certain culture, they suffer the war, uh, they suffer atrocities in the war, they suffer trauma in the war and they come back to a post-war culture and they find themselves completely out of place. They find themselves as misfits of a particular culture and its entire idea of moving out, uh, of becoming uh, alienated from a certain culture is a very good example of how culture moves. So when I say I don't find myself connected to a culture anymore, uh, I don't find myself familiarized to a culture anymore, which, what I'm essentially saying is uh, this act of defamiliarization has happened because culture has moved on and I, have, I haven't moved on um, in, in sync with a particular culture, right? So. The idea of moving, the idea of you know mutability, the idea of movement is something which is inherent in every culture. And for every any culture to be organic and alive and flourishing and thriving, movement is a precondition. Uh, movement, uh, mutability, uh, mobility, these are the preconditions. These are the fundamental conditions of any culture. If the culture doesn't move, it dies a natural death. Right? So, you know, I'm, I'm requesting you, I'm advising you to look at culture as an organic, mutable phenomenon, not as a complex process of becoming, uh, being and becoming. This play between being and becoming is something which characterizes almost every culture. Right? So, what Remy Williams says over here is when he went to the war, he, he was located in a particular culture. Now, when he came back after the war, he found himself completely dislocated. Now, how does dislocation happen? This dislocation happens because of the movement in culture. The culture has moved on when he was at the war and he found back and he came back and he found himself completely alienated uh, from this, the, this particular culture and he finds a comrade uh, he talks to and both of them agree and as it's a very dramatic agreement, uh, they almost say it simultaneously as it's written in the passage. The fact is, they just don't speak the same language. So language has changed. Now, by language, of course, uh, Williams means discourse, vocabulary, uh, I mean, language can be used as a metaphor sometimes, right? I mean, it's not just a language in which I'm talking to you and the language which you use to speak to other people. The language can be body language, language can be sartorial language, how you dress can also become a language, can also become a statement, uh, how you eat can also become a statement, etc. So when he says they don't speak the same language, uh, the language becomes a metaphor of a cultural change, a profound cultural change, uh, which sort of has essentially alienated this individual who went to the war. Okay, so now drawing on that, uh, moving on, we come to Williams's definition of culture. Now, how does it define culture? It's a very interesting definition and I, I advise you to read the entire passage from this particular book called uh, Keywords, the Vocabulary of Culture and Society. It was published uh, you know, you know, many years ago, but it's still very relevant today because it's, it's more like a dictionary of culture. Right? It's something which you can use, something which you can draw on and what, what it teaches you essentially is how uh, certain cultural words travel through time. They start with a, with, a, with a meaning and they end with a completely different meaning. So the same happens in the word culture, ironically. So he says, and I'm quoting him over here, the complexity of the modern development of the word culture, he talks about culture, this is the entry on culture on the dictionary, and of its modern usage can then be appreciated. We can easily distinguish the sense which depends on the literal continuity of physical process as now in sugar beet culture or in the specialized physical application in bacteriology since the 1880s, germ culture. But once we go beyond the physical reference, we have to recognize three broad active categories of usage. So culture essentially it comes from you know the same root as cultivation. So culture means cultivation. Culture means growing something. Uh, originally it came from that kind of a you know root. So we still use we still retain that meaning when you use uh, in the culture of bacteria, the culture of sugar beet, etc. So that was the original uh, rooted meaning of the word. But obviously it's travel, and now it has come to three broad uh, kinds of usage categories of usage as Willem says. The first one is the independent 
an abstract noun which describes a general process of intellectual, spiritual and aesthetic development from 18th century. So, you know, again, look at the combination, intellectual, spiritual and aesthetic. Now, all these are very abstract uh, definitions, very abstract categories, but none of these are completely or absolutely abstract. And this is something I would keep saying. There's nothing called absolute abstraction. Uh, every form of abstraction is a production uh, from a certain material process. Okay, it's never divorced absolutely from the material process. Second, the independent noun, whether used generally or specifically, which indicates a particular way of life, whether of a people, a period, a group, or humanity in general. So, a way of life, a lifestyle, in other words, a narrative of life, how you use a life, how you live a life. So, again, we find the very second definition uh, tells you there's a certain degree of coded quality in culture. It's, it's a set of codes which you have to abide by, have to conform. Now, obviously, the codes keep changing. Now, when we do cultural studies, what we essentially try to do is decode culture. Uh, look at the codes, how the codes are sort of configured in the first place, how they are tuned in in the first place. And once you figure that out, once you figure out how they are tuned in, then our job would be to sort of detune it, to find out how to deconstruct it, to deconstruct the code of quality of culture. So, how does, uh, how do people, uh, how does a community live a life, right? Now, obviously, it's a very loaded question. How a community lives a life depends on the geography of the place, depends on the history of the place, depends on the economic condition of the community, etc., which can never be taken away from the coded quality which we call culture. Thirdly, the independent and abstract noun which describes the works and practices of intellectual and especially artistic activity. Now, this seems most this seems often now the most widespread use, culture is music, literature, painting and sculpture, theatre and film. A ministry of culture refers to these specific activities, sometimes with additional of philosophy, scholarship, history. Now, we have uh, a ministry of culture. Now, the culture over here means it's very lofty uh, human pursuits like literature, art, philosophy, films, etc. They're all brought together under the umbrella term of culture. Now, uh, what it means is culture becomes a symbol of a particular community. Uh, how does uh, it becomes a marker, a uh, reserver for the achievements of a community, achievements in art, achievements in language, achievements in you know, uh, cinema, achievements in painting, achievements in literature, etc. So, culture becomes a bit of an, you know, a kind of configuration, a kind of coded configuration which is achieved by a certain human population at any given particular point in history. Okay? That's very important to know. Now, what, when we do culture studies, what we are aware of, what we are interested in essentially is how these configurations happen, uh, how do these literary productions take place, how do these you know, lofty lyrics written, uh, what are the conditions which inform the production of these lyrics, production of these films, production of painting, etc. Right? So, because you know, even if you look at one culture, even if you say, quote unquote, say, say we're interested in German culture or British culture or Indian culture or French culture, we find you know, even within that one kind of one demography of culture, there are different historical shifts. Right? So, the shift from history point A to point B uh, is accompanied by a shift in culture. Right? It could be a cultural decline, it could be a cultural upliftment, it could be a cultural progress, etc. But the shift is, uh, is a condition, the mutability is a condition in culture. Right? Now, next we come to a very key term uh, and this is a term which is uh, almost synonymous with culture, you know, it's almost inseparable from culture to a certain extent, the question of identity, right? So, how does identity, how do identities uh, operate in culture? How are identities informed in culture? So, identities play a key role in culture and cultural formations inasmuch as they become vehicles for articulations, consolidation, as well as subversions of cultural categories. Now, and these three words, I've carefully chosen these words because I think we need to spend some time uh, in looking at these words, articulation, consolidation and subversion. Now, articulation, of course, is the iteration of culture, the iterative quality of culture. You're saying something, you know, you're making a statement about a particular culture, it becomes a cultural statement. You're pronouncing a culture, you're announcing a culture, right? Consolidation is a strengthening of that culture, right? So, by repeated articulation and by articulation, I'm not just meaning saying it, you're making a statement. It could be the way you're wearing a dress, it could be the way you're worshipping a particular religion, it could be the way you are eating a certain kind of food, it could be a way you're spending your, your money in a, in a certain way, it could be the way you're driving a certain car. So, all these become articulations.
Now, consolidation is the way in which uh, a particular identity is strengthened, right? So, consolidation depends on articulation to a certain extent. I mean, it's a repeated articulation. So, you keep articulating something and in the process you consolidate it. You become, you, you transform something into a hegemonic identity, a dominant identity, right? Now, subversion is, a, is, is an interesting thing. Subversion is a resistance uh, towards hegemony. You subvert something means you deconstruct something, you question something, right? Now, oftentimes you find that subversions or subversive styles they become hegemonic after a certain point. So, what is subversive today, what is rebellious today might become fashionable tomorrow, right? What is fashionable today might become rebellious tomorrow. So, again, uh, it brings us back to this old question of mutability, right? The mutability, the mobility, the plasticity of culture, the elasticity of culture. So, uh, every, like I said, all cultures would die natural deaths if they were not elastic. So, elasticity is something of a condition in culture. So, subversion, consolidation, articulation. So, it appears over here that these are different ontological categories, but actually they are quite, uh, it's perfectly possible for them to merge into each other, right? Like I said, what is subversive today might become hegemony tomorrow uh, and vice versa. So, identities can be hegemonic, subordinate, complicit and subversive in relation to culture and cultural locations. Thus, any serious study of culture must take into account the politics of producing, preserving and propagating identities. So, you know, if you look at these adjectives, hegemonic, subordinate, complicit and subversive. So, hegemonic of course is dominant. Uh, when I say and this is a hegemonic identity, what I'm saying essentially this is a dominant identity, right? This is the top identity. Uh, subordinate is something which is, you know, you know, after hegemonic, something which obeys the hegemonic identity, something which is inferior to hegemonic identity. Complicit is interesting. Complicit means something which is not in itself hegemonic, but something which supports the hegemonic identity, right? So, when I'm saying, uh, you know, he is complicit to the crime, what I'm essentially saying is, uh, he is not maybe part of the crime, he's not playing the lead role in the crime, but he's supporting the crime, he's supporting the process of the crime. So, when I'm saying, complicit category uh, of culture. I'm, what I'm essentially saying is that section of culture who are not hegemonic, but they want, they support in the hegemony, they support in the status quo to a certain extent. Subversive, as I just explained to you, is the rebellious bit in culture, something which rebels against hegemony, something which uh, tries to bring down hegemony, something which moves against any kind of dominance. Now, uh, what I'm saying over here essentially is any serious study of culture, when I'm looking at culture as a process, as a mutable, complex process of phenomenon which combines economic and material attributes, when I'm using that definition of culture, which we will uh, for the purpose of this course, uh, we must take into account the politics of producing, preserving and propagating identities. Now, you, you may have noticed already that I'm not using the word creating, I'm using the word producing because I am trying to underline the constructive quality of culture. When I'm saying producing something, there's a degree of materiality to it. Whereas, if we use it about creating something, uh, it, it seems as if it's an act of abstraction. It's something which you're using with your, you're doing with your brain, something which you're using uh, with your intellect, with your imagination alone. And of course, uh, that is how imagination o operates, that is how creation happens. But then, of course, the point is no act of creation exists in a vacuum. Uh, no act of you know, producing something exists in a vacuum, it must be used, it must be brought out to a certain material condition. So, hence the word producing, because the word producing is more banal than creating and, and I'm, I'm deliberately being banal over here for the purpose of this course. So, it's the way you're producing identities, the politics of production. So, not just production, because production is a very loaded term. When I'm using the word producing or production, uh, it has to be, uh, you know, used alongside the, the conditions of production. What are the economic, ideological, uh, social conditions of production which governed uh, the act of production? And preserving and propagating identity. So, there are three P's essentially, producing, preserving and propagating, right? So, when you produce an identity, when you produce a certain cultural icon, a cultural marker, how do you preserve it, right? And how do you propagate it? Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that, you know, if you want to make something hegemonic, you must push it, right? And the push for hegemonic identity must happen to an economy process. So, when you want a certain kind of style to become hegemonic style, you must advertise it, you must make it visible, you must circulate it, you must disseminate it. You must see to it that that style gets consumed endlessly uh, ad infinitum, right? So, only then it becomes a hegemonic style, only then it becomes a hegemonic markup, 
right? Now, of course, I'm using metaphors over here. That can be anything. That can be language, a certain way of speaking. That can be accent, a certain manner of speaking. That can be dress, a certain way of dressing. Sartorial culture is a very important thing. Uh, that can be food. So how, how do certain food items become fashionable? And it can only become fashionable or hegemonic if it's circulated, if it's consumed uh, en masse, if it's consumed, you know, across society. Uh, you know, you find it in shops everywhere, you find it in big restaurants, very posh cafes, etc. So, you know, it becomes an economic activity to a certain extent. So again, this brings us back to the idea of culture as an activity, right? Not as something which is static or, you know, a, a dormant thing which we can analyze, but it's an activity, it's a very organic activity uh, which, you know, brings into account, uh, which brings into play economy, politics, language, uh, all kinds of things together, right? Okay. So, and then which brings us to the, you know, natural extension of this is the characteristics of culture. So, one of the key characteristics of culture, one that must be taken into account in any serious cultural studies course is the innate and almost organic mutability. I've already spoken about it, but I'll highlight it again over here. It's innate. So, this organic mutability is something which is innate in culture, something which is there in culture all the time. It's a, it's a condition in every culture. Now, this organicity or this organic mutability, it informs the material as well as the abstract attributes of culture. So, let's talk of something like values, right? So, you know, which are part of almost all cultures like identities. So, you know, when we use the word values, so when I say, you know, this culture has very great values, or there are certain values which should be followed, which should be respected, etc. We don't use the word value normally as a material thing. We use the word value as an abstract thing. Values just kindness, compassion, mercy. Uh, these are very abstract things. These are, you know, attributes, abstract attributes, uh, not so much uh, material things. However, uh, values can be considered or should be considered, I think, in my, in my mind as a quotient for cultural consolidation in terms of mapping out acceptable and unacceptable codes of conduct. Now, I'm using the word mapping out quite deliberately over here. When I'm mapping out something, it's a material process, right? So, when I'm saying these things are mapped in and these things are mapped out, what I'm saying essentially is certain things are included and certain things are excluded. Which brings me, which brings us rather, to the idea of representation. Now, representation is a very innate quality of every culture. So, every culture is represented. I mean, culture has to be represented. It can be represented through dress, it can be represented through your dietary customs, it can be represented by your uh, linguistic activities, it can be represented by the manner of speaking, the manner of walking, politics, language, religion, everything. So, all forms, all vehicles, all markers of culture become acts of representation. Now, every act of representation, as you know, and this is a bit of a theoretical thing, a theoretical study of representation, every act of representation includes, oh, rather combines inclusion and exclusion. So, when you're representing something, you're including certain attributes and equally, you're excluding certain attributes. So, this act of inclusion and exclusion happen almost simultaneously. And again, the word entanglement is useful over here because, you know, if you use the word entanglement, that saves you a lot of time because what, what it immediately uh, describes or underlines or highlights is the unmappable quality uh, of representation. I mean, you can't quantify to what extent it is including certain things, to what extent it is excluding certain things. It's a very unquantifiable process. That's exactly how representation works. Now, values, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at values as quotient for cultural consolidation in terms of mapping out acceptable and unacceptable codes of conduct. And again, these are very, very historically sensitive things, very context sensitive things. Um, so, what is unacceptable uh, in 18th century, Rome, uh, 18th century Germany might be perfectly acceptable in 21st century Delhi or, or you know, 21st century Chennai. So, again, uh, the location of the place is important, the geography of the place is important, the history of the place is important. You can't possibly look at culture by divorcing culture from these attributes, right? So, acceptable, non-acceptable, these codes change all the time, mapping in, mapping out, these change all the time as well. So, values are not something which are absolute. Values, of course, are uh, mutable. Values, of course, are constructed. Values, of course, can be, you know, uh, deconstructed and reconstructed. So, in other words, uh, values too have a textual quality like culture, right? So, the textuality of culture, the textuality of values is something which we should be aware of, especially in cultural studies.
So values can be notoriously mutable and determined by economic, political, and ideological conditions. So, you know, again, values like art, like religion, like dress, like food, uh, they, they, they cannot be separated possibly from economic, ideological, material conditions. So values too are productions. Right, so um, the word production is, is is something which you use endlessly, it's something which you'll hear endlessly, it'll probably bore you, but it's a useful word in cultural studies, right? So when you're using cultural studies, production is something which you use all the time because that's what happens in culture. Culture is produced through material conditions. Uh, language is produced, art is produced, uh, literature is produced, cinema is produced, and that becomes a part of you know the activity of culture, right? Now this is. Just a reiteration and a consolidation of what I just said. This is Terry Eagleton, the very famous Marxist critic, uh, quoting from a very interesting book called Literary Theory and Introduction, a book I suggest you should read, uh, especially those of you who come from literature background uh, and you're looking at the interface of literature and cultural studies. This is one of the basic beginners books that you should be reading, uh, you know, very, very illustrative, very useful and very elegantly written. Now. Uh, Eagleton over here is basically dramatizing the mutability of values. He's saying values change all the time and it is we're being unwise if you're saying that values are you know, universal, values don't change. So times change, values don't. Announces an advertisement for a daily newspaper. As though we still believe in killing of inf informed infants or putting the mentally ill on public show. Just as people may treat a work as philosophy in one century and as literature in the next, or vice versa, so they may change their minds about what writing they consider valuable. They may even change their minds about the grounds they use for judging what is valuable and what is not. So, you know, the references, there are two very, very interesting references over here. One is the killing of inform infant. Now, some of you might be aware that this was a very common practice, especially in ancient, uh, in ancient Greece, where, you know, in Sparta, which was a military capital of Greece, every male child who was born would be sort of taken to a particular hill, kept on a stone and, you know, covered with a leaf for the whole night. And then the next morning, the, the people would go up to the hill and see the child had survived the cold. If the child had survived the cold, uh, he would be raised as a soldier. If the child died in the cold, which was perfectly possible, then the assumption was it was not strong enough uh, to be a Spartan soldier. Now, this custom of taking a baby, an infant, uh, taking it to a stone, you know, putting it on a stone and then covering it with a leaf just to test its strength, its durability, its longevity against natural conditions it would sound barbaric to us today. It, it will sound barbaric to everyone. Uh, every rational person today would be shocked on listening, on hearing this. But uh, mind you, this was a perfectly acceptable practice. This was part of the value system of a very sophisticated culture at one point of time, the Spartan culture, the Greek culture, which we use sometimes uh, as we hail sometimes as an epitome of human civilization, as an epitome of human cultural achievement. But even in that kind of cultural achievement, we find these barbaric customs. The second reference that Eagleton mentions is putting the mentally ill on public show. This is more recent. Uh, as late as 18th century, we have examples of people, you know, mad people taken out of asylums and made to walk in the streets, uh, you know, for entertainment of the rational people on the streets. And this is again a barbaric custom according to us today. But this was perfectly practiced in France, uh, in England, and different parts of Europe, Western Europe, uh, which countries which we now consider to be very cultural countries, very sophisticated countries, countries which are progressive in terms of how they look at uh, you know, medically ill people or mad people. But then at one point in time, not very distant, distant past, uh, the, the very common practice was to put mad people on public show, uh, to be consumed as spectacular entertainments, right? So what Eagleton is saying here is, uh, you know, these cultural uh, you know, customs, these cultural activities, which are barbaric to us today, was perfectly uh, acceptable and also sophisticated to a certain extent uh, and not too distant past. So the next bit is more interesting. So he's saying just as people may treat a work as philosophy in one century and as literature in the next. So what is being said over here is a parameters change. So what is philosophy today might become fiction tomorrow. Right? What is religion today might become fiction tomorrow, might become fantasy tomorrow. The very, it's, a, it's a very generic kind of a change, ontological generic change. Uh, so what happens is how, how, the interesting question is how does this change happen? So what are the conditions which create this change, which produce this change? Right? So, you know, a work of religion 
today, which people have faith in, which people believe to be true, how does it become uh, a work of fiction tomorrow, a work of fantasy tomorrow, a work of philosophy, which, you know, philosophy obviously comes, you know, it, 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 the assumption is it's true, it's, it's the truth about life, etc. How does it become literature tomorrow, right? And you can think of examples of how works of philosophy are now read as works of literature, etc., right? There are several examples in our country as well, uh, where we have this change. Uh, now, the, the key question is, uh, they may change their minds about what, they, what writing they consider valuable, right? And this is a very important thing. So, this brings us to the idea of valuable writing and non-valuable writing, right? So, when, I, when I'm saying valuable writing, I'm talking about high literature, high art, etc. And non-valuable writing could be pulp fiction, could be bestsellers, etc. Now, again, these categories are very contingent categories, very complex categories and they're changing all the time. So what is valuable writing today might be trash tomorrow and vice versa. I just mentioned Shakespeare to you. you know, when I said that Shakespeare today is obviously high art, high literature, but at one point in time when he was actually writing this place, when he was producing this place, he was just looked at as an entertainer, someone who was a uh, a, a, you know, a showman really, someone who wanted his theatres, his dramas to be uh, commercial successes. That was all they was interested in. Right. So. Uh, and the other question, the, the related question is, they may even change their minds about the grounds they use for judging what is valuable and what is not. So the, the parameters, the measuring instruments uh, that are used to give value to certain works of art, those instruments may change, those, those parameters might change. And again, this change is a material change. This change happens through economic conditions, through material conditions, through ideological conditions. Right. And so he moves on, he goes on with this definition and he says, this is Eagleton again, value is, an in, is a transitive term, it's, it's, it's a moving process. It means that whatever is valued by certain people in specific situations according to particular criteria and in the light of given purposes. It is thus quite possible that given a deep enough transformation of our history, we may in the future produce a society which is unable to get anything at all out of Shakespeare. This might sound shocking to us today. We think Shakespeare is universal, Shakespeare is timeless, we can always draw from Shakespeare lessons of life, etc. But Eagleton is saying it is perfectly possible that we arrive at a certain human condition, at a human society, where Shakespeare becomes completely useless, completely valueless. We, people don't get anything out of Shakespeare at all. It is possible that we arrive at such a condition. His works might simply seem desperately alien, full of styles of thought and feeling, which such society find, found, found limited or irrelevant. Again, irrelevant. I mean, it's valueless, essentially. In such a situation, Shakespeare would be no more valuable than much present-day graffiti. Uh, and though many people would consider such a social condition tragically impoverished, it seems to me dogmatic not to entertain the possibility that it might arise rather from a general human enrichment. Now, what he's saying is he's sort of pitching a conventional uh, take on Shakespeare with an unconventional take on Shakespeare. Now, if I say uh, if I, if two people have a conversation and one of them says, you know, there might be a time when Shakespeare would just become pulp fiction, Shakespeare might just become wall art and nothing else. The common response, the conventional response would be, oh, that would be such a shame, that would be such a tragic impoverishment of culture, you know, when you can't take Shakespeare critically, when you can't look at Shakespeare as a lofty literary you know, activity, then obviously that means the cultural decline has happened. Now. What Eagleton is saying is interesting. He's saying it's dogmatic, it is irrational, it is dogmatic to understand, to assume that, you know, when Shakespeare is, uh, you know, irrelevant, that necessarily means a cultural impoverishment has happened. It is perfectly possible, Eagleton argues, that such a condition may arise out of human enrichment. The people move on from Shakespeare, people find something better. Maybe they found something, you know, a better way of looking at life, a better way of looking at literature. They moved on from Shakespeare and hence Shakespeare is relegated to something uh, of a wall art or graffiti, etc. So it is perfectly possible, Eagle argues, that you know Shakespeare becomes wall art in a condition which is superior to the condition that we inhabit today. In other words, nothing is sacred enough not to change, right? No work of literature, no work of politics, no work of painting, no work of anything really is sacred enough not to change. So the sacrality of something should be questioned because everything is a construct, everything has been produced in certain historical material conditions. And because it's produced in certain conditions, it can be reproduced, it can also be deproduced, right? It can be sort of 
irrelevant at some point in time because it came out of some historical conditions. And when those conditions change, it might be perfectly possible for that work to become irrelevant completely. Right. So, so just to conclude, actually, I mean, the first lecture, uh, essentially what we've just said, and I'm just sort of summarizing what we just said, uh, culture should be looked at as a complex activity, a complex phenomenon. It's organic, it's mutable, it's plastic, it's elastic, it's changing all the time. It constitutes things which are abstract as well as material. And the interesting thing about culture is a very asymmetric combination of abstraction and materiality. Right? And the things associated with culture like values, uh, customs, codes, etc., these two change all the time. So, what we look at in the next lectures uh, in the course of this particular you know, lesson is that you know, how the constructed quality of culture should be studied, should be examined as a material condition and how these material conditions produce things which appear non-material like art, lofty attributes, you know, etc. Right. So, this concludes the first lecture. I hope you got something out of it. And please go to the references of your views and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.